Sunday nights from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's K Fox Night Beat with DJ Nastiness. Bringing back the memories. Bringing back the memories. <laughs> Bringing Seattle's hottest music. Bringing Seattle's hottest music. Rainier Avenue Radio. World. Hello, listener. What's important to you about what's going on in your community? Are you interested? Are you concerned? In any case, I invite you to tune into my show, Seattle Here and Now, on RainierAvenueRadio.world. Why? I will be covering a wide range of topics important to you and impacting the community. Each show will have a special guest or guests to share with you information on a variety of subjects that are happening here and now in Seattle. I promise I will work hard to make my show informative, interesting, and entertaining. Be sure to listen to Seattle Here and Now on Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. The Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, empowering communities and changing lives. The Urban League has been there to serve when our community is at its lowest. It's never mattered what the crisis was. The systemic oppression remains constant for those most vulnerable. Here at the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, we'll be temporarily adjusting our hours of operation and available services. If you are in need of resources, we recommend that you give us a call at 206-461-3792. To make an appointment, press zero and speak with the reception. Walk-in hours will be from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. And hey, we'll gladly work with you via phone as best as we can if you're exhibiting any signs of illness to assist you with information to save your home, find you a place to sleep, or connect you to job opportunities. The Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. That's 206 461 3792. You're listening to Rainier Avenue Radio. World. Check us out on social media. Facebook and Instagram, RainierAvenueRadio.world, and on Twitter at Rainier Ave Radio. You're listening to Heartbeat Radio. I'm your host, Cindy Bright. Heartbeat Radio is a conversation aimed to take the pulse of corporate America. Opportunities for people of color, we're getting lost in the shuffle of change. I'm that provocateur of change. The hearts of corporate America are addressed. Access and opportunities will be accelerated for all people. Through Heartbeat Radio, you will gain a deeper understanding of what is necessary for change. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio. I'm the host, Cindy Bright, and we have a great show planned for you this evening. Um, let me first welcome back. Joy was on vacation last week. Let me welcome in my co-host, Joy Stanford, to have this conversation with us tonight. We're excited about uh, our guest tonight because... As you know, every week we're here talking about issues uh, to try to help progress the lives of brown and black people. And so uh, it has been my view, uh, and now in my third year of doing this show, that this requires both a movement in business as well as in politics. Both are necessary. We are so thrilled to have both people, both sides of that coin on the show tonight. Let me first welcome in. Uh, she is a rock star here in the Seattle area. She is the former CEO of Treehouse. Treehouse focused on uh, foster kids, predominantly brown and black kids. Janice Avery is a legend in this town and has done so much work uh, in racial equity. And so we are thrilled to introduce her and welcome her onto Heartbeat Radio this evening. Where is she? There she is. Hi. Thanks, Cindy and Joy. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen you in a couple of years. How are you? Really doing well. It's great to see you. Good, good, good. I, I see you're up to some new things. Uh, before we dive into the whole racial equity, I see you are now uh, the interim uh, executive director of Yoga Behind Bars. Yes. What, what an incredible that? organization. It's, um, it's a tiny little organization with a big mission to really empower and heal people who are living behind bars and they teach incarcerated people to be yoga instructors within the institutions. So it's really, it's a liberatory, uh, restorative, transformative justice strategy. And I'm here in this bridge role to, to help prepare the ground for the next leader. Awesome. Do you want to talk in general uh, about your time at Treehouse because you're a legend in this town and I know that. <laughs> and, a legend, and a legend amongst um, Emerge Sisters because my Emerge sister Dawn Rains works there. So um, you are a legend. <laughs> yes. 
Well, I had the great privilege of being at Treehouse for almost 25 years and helped the organization to grow from a teeny one doing important but incidental things for kids, sending them to camp and paying for music lessons and then moving into tutoring. And along the way, we grew and developed a relationship in the community where people really cared deeply about children in foster care. And in the last 10 years I was there, we decided we had to do something transformative and for those young people because they were having such terrible outcomes at the end of the foster care experience, um, leaving foster care and being at high risk of incarceration, mental illness, alcoholism and the like. And we just thought these beautiful young people had to have a better opportunity. So we started something called Graduation Success dramatically increased the high school graduation rate, and then we extended into young adulthood to help youth, really foster youth's experience as they moved into young adulthood in post-secondary education and employment. Mm -hmm. Can you and tell us about your lens for the children of color that were coming through that program? It's, it sounds like you guys really took... Um, notice of who was coming through the program. First of all, you acknowledged that and then went about making sure that those um, kids had what they needed. Yeah. Well, in the, the organization was founded by white people and was traditionally majority white. Um, and when we set that big goal for kids to graduate at the same rate as, rate as their peer group, we set two companion goals. One was that youth would graduate at the same rate as their peer group, regardless of their demographics. And the second is that we would have a diverse, racially diverse staff, and that those staff would have a consistent experience also in, in the context of the organization. And so over the course of the last, you know, 10, five to 10 years, we've been really specifically looking at those young people's experience and helping to make sure they were matched with people who understood their racial identity and how to support them. Um, really great advocates for them in school where um, there are terrible outcomes for the young people. I love it. I love it. I, I, you know, I, really, you've done so much you, I don't know what that noise is I'm hearing um, coming through the, uh, okay, it quieted. Um, you know, this era that we're in right now, this racial reckoning era, um, you've done so much work around race with your team, uh, with yourself as a CEO. What does leadership in this era, what do you believe leadership needs to look like at this time? Well, I th obviously it needs, oh boy, this is, is me, I think. Hang on a second. Oh, it's okay. It's the station. Just message me and said they're they're dealing with it. It's on the station. It's on us. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, uh oh, now we, oh, you're you're on mute, Janice. There we go. <laughs> Clearly, leadership in the human services and education, where I have spent my entire life, needs to be. Uh, more racially diverse and more gender diverse. Um, the very highest levels of nonprofit and education leadership tend to be white men. And the it is so clear that the lived experience of people who have common experiences needs to be in the leadership of the organizations in order to do the work that really will be transformative in our communities and change kids' lives. So at Treehouse, um, we did some of that work. And I'll, I'll tell you, Cindy, in terms of kind of what, how do we need to be as leaders in order to lead toward racial equity? I think the first and key work is work on ourselves. And in my experience, I was a kind of passive re recipient of the training that was called cultural competency and then racial equity and then racial justice oriented work. And after we'd set those goals I talked about, I'd been through about 18 months of workshops and trainings and consultation <laughs> and realized I had not changed, that I remained mm. kind of fragile white person, segregated, uh, living a mostly white life with very little diversity in my experience. 
and that if I were to lead Treehouse toward these goals of youth graduating at the same rate as their peer group, um, of a staff growing in racial diversity throughout the organization, that I had to change. And so the message I would have for leaders um, who are white in particular, but probably all of us, because we all have to deal with identity in some way, is we really have to understand our own identity and study racial, our racial history um, and get real with ourselves about talking about race, getting feedback about race, and really driving toward different racial outcomes um, in our organizations, in our communities, and in the world. How do other white leaders respond to you saying those sorts of things? And, you know, I, I, you know, the cynical side of me is, I don't know if you saw, I took a screenshot of your post that you did, that you addressed it to other white leaders. And I said, I love it when the whites address each other because it is the white people's work to be done. And most executive positions, CEO positions are held by white men for the most part. How are they responding or reacting or receiving uh, the kind of language that you're using and the recommendations of working on themselves? It's being pretty well received. It, mm -hmm. Interestingly, and I think, I think it helps for white people to step up with this message and lean in and help one another as well. It's, it's hard work to be a leader of any kind. And there's a I think a false belief that we have to be experts in everything. There are plenty of experts about how to make the world more racially equitable and they don't tend to be white leaders. So it means we have to really uh, build our curiosity, our humility, our transparency and vulnerability. And when I have talked to other white leaders about this and I'm doing a little bit of consulting about it um, since my retirement, Folks who contact me are really ready to hear that message and ready to take it on. I hope it, it. I hope what happens is we have some diversity within these companies and nonprofits that are currently, you know, being run by those folks. You know, when you left Treehouse, I loved the advice you gave: be ambitious and bold. Nothing's gained from being timid. But, you know, sometimes when you have a woman, particularly a black woman, come in and be ambitious and bold, it isn't taken that way. So what would you say to that? Yes. No, there isn't that the truth? So <laughs> I, I, when I decided to leave, the board and I agreed that they would do everything in their power to bring on a leader of color to replace me. And um, so we did something really very special uh, with that wonderful consultant, Malia LaCour. We asked her to facilitate a focus group and we invited five CEOs who are African-American to come in in a kind of a fishbowl focus group and talk with her about their experience leading organizations, interacting with white boards and what supported mm -hmm. them and what got in their way. And it was a beautiful conversation that just, I think really moved my board to understand the issues better. They certainly were not experts, um, but I think, I think we have to prepare the ground. I don't think we have to be timid about doing that either but to toss a particularly black but any person of color into a leadership role in what's been a primarily white organization right. a white leader has been, is, is asking a lot without doing that kind of sensitivity raising together mm -hmm. Your chair of the board at the time, I'm, I'm pretty sure she's watching the show tonight, Yes, uh, was Amy Mullins. Amy w Mullins is a badass white woman, let me just you say. Know it. Yeah. <laughs> well, she, when, she is a fierce, and yes. uh, I used to have conversations with her uh, and you about these sorts of issues, and watching um, her transform in this process as well. Mm -hmm. Um, she has become a bold advocate for racial equity too. Now, what I'm noticing, you know, Joy, I'm open to your perspective on it, but the nonprofit space is more ready to move towards uh, racial equity than the corporate uh, America side, the profit for greed um, side of the house. What, what would you say to your counterparts who have a different tax structure who refuse to progress brown and black people 
uh, claiming that there aren't enough people in the talent pool or whatever the excuses are, what advice would you give to them? Well, let me just say there's plenty of talent. There is no lack of talent. I mean, just period. So let's say that to start with. So, you know, white people tend to hire people like themselves. And since exactly. white people are doing most of the hiring, they're hiring white people. Mm -hmm. And they, they hire people from their colleges, they hire people from their clubs, they hire people they are associated with. And that particular bias is one I just would, would highlight for everybody. But there are two things that I think are important on the profit side. For one thing, very shortly, the United States of America is not going to be white majority in population. And to think that a white majority company can anticipate and meet the needs of a really dramatically diverse population in this country is foolhardy. Right. So that's like that's number right. one. And then number two is that when you hire a lot of people like you, they tend to think alike. And the business problems of this particular time are very complex and really need lots of different perspectives. So we have to hire those people and then we have to foster interest and curiosity in those perspectives and grow together. And I guess the th I had a third thing that came and went, it might come back. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when that happens. Um, Janice, what do you think the, um, I'll just use the term post pandemic workforce will look like now? Like um, maybe saying that different you know, many of the brown and black people that I converse with or coach or whatever that is, many of them are telling me they don't want to go back into the office because the environments have been so toxic for them and no one's ever listened to them when they have tried to raise issues. And any black woman knows anytime we raise an issue, there's always a problem with things that we say. And so what do you think or what are you hearing about post-pandemic workforce and what that's going to look and feel like? Women are ex have exited at a rapid pace. What do you think about that? No, I think any leader really has to pay attention <laughs> to this moment because I do think there are, is a sizable population of employees who are really very, very happy not being in their work environments. Absolutely. They're not safe there. Mm -hmm. And so they're more productive even if they're not so visible, because there's there's a lot of lot written about visibility being a problem for people working remotely. That if you're not seen, you're not promoted. So that's so that's an issue leaders need to look at. But they also just need to pay attention to who doesn't come, come back into the office mm -hmm. and inquire. What what would make you want to be a part of this office environment again? I mean, what a powerful question to ask and to really mm -hmm. listen to people instead of insisting because there there are definitely companies saying everyone's coming back period and i think they're going to miss an opportunity to assess what people's needs are and how this has been liberating for some folks to be yes. at home you know so i just i'm hoping that folks lean into and be curious instead of just pound back into what it was and not fall into what you guys literally just wrote that down, not seen, not promoted. That'll be the next excuse that business will use yeah. to um, say that they're not performing or they're not, you know, if they're not part of the club. And um, yeah, that's typically, I think what the path is to be seen is to hang out with everybody. And so I'm just kind of curious, are, you know, CEOs and leaders starting to think different or are, they going back to the same old way that it used to be and to use your term uh i haven't heard another ceo use the term people are not safe and so that is a powerful statement as a chief executive a white ceo to state that people are not safe in these environments and it is awesome that you acknowledge that that is in fact true well and i have frankly gotten that feedback myself which has just then led me to really hear what the issues are and, and try to make change. And the difference is you're listening. Yeah. The difference is you're listening to that feedback because I I heard that the first six months of the pandemic is I love working from home. I don't have that, that passive aggressive microaggression things that happen in an office or a cubicle board. You know, it's just, I'm doing my work, I'm focused, I'm much more productive. And you as a CEO, listen to that 
there's the key and you acknowledged it. Janice, um, there's a lot going through my mind as you said that because I know you personally and so I know your makeup, if you will. I know who you are, uh, which is a person of, um, you're a good human, just from your core, you're good. And so, <laughs> nice, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, that's genuine because I think there's a, a difference when you comment about, you know, people have given you that feedback and First off, for people to feel comfortable enough to say that to you is huge. huge. Yeah. Right to tell you. And second, I wouldn't have told my boss that. <laughs> oh, well, you know, when a few of us have, we've seen a door slammed in our face. Yeah. I'm um, so sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, that's that's the reality. But, um, yeah. you know, the what's the word I'm looking for? The personal transformation that CEOs, executives must have we can say emotional intelligence and they'll all nod their heads and act like they have it, but do they, but do they? <laughs> Clearly not. I thought I did. When, when we started doing this work very intensively at Treehouse, we're a crowd of people who are social workers, mental health practitioners, teachers. You would think we'd have the highest emotional intelligence of any workplace. And when it came to talking about race, we really didn't have the skills. And so we did have to do a lot of work on, on those skills of listening, really hearing people and not being defensive and being, Air. the word I use constantly is curious. Why is there this different point of view? How can I understand it better? And the more I've stretched in that space, the better a leader I have been. But you know, Cindy and Joy, I have lost talented people. And some of these are people who've given me this feedback that it didn't feel safe. And I was scrambling to try to get the right thing to happen. Oh. And, it, and I was unsuccessful. And so it was so painful to lose talented people. Um, and it really just made me keep working harder to do better. Were they not feeling safe with you or safe with the culture or safe with other leaders? Was it all Good of that? Question, Cindy. So Great think, question. All of the above, I mean, mostly, like you said, people felt comfortable talking to me, mm -hmm. but I couldn't, first of all, no leader can police anything. So you really have yes. to work together yes. to build a culture that that is really welcoming and accepting. And it doesn't work, even if one person isn't in it to win it, it doesn't work. It's... You, I think there's this whole defensiveness too, like you said, when you start talking and having that um, difficult conversation, um, everybody wants to get defensive or instead of just being in it and talking through and not pointing fingers and, and giving collective solutions and collaborative solutions. And, you know, I just, there's something to be said for that. So, but if you have one person that's not in it, that's that's what I would say. That's why you lost those folks. Because well, why you, you were good, but why yeah, is it so evolving. difficult? Why is it so difficult to talk about race? Well, I think um, certainly people in my generation who grew up during the '60s thought it was that racial strife was behind us. White people thought that. <laughs> Let me just be clear. White people thought that. My mother. Oh, we said that she was colorblind. I thought that was a good thing. Even my early professional education, this is way back in like 1980, my first class in, in uh, my master's in social work program about diversity taught us checklists of attributes of cultural groups. You know, so, so the way we have been introduced to, to race or not, you know, I grew up in a white suburb. I went to a mostly white school, a mostly white college, moved to mostly white Seattle. I mean, <laughs> the opportunities have not been that great in some ways in many of our communities if we're white and we were taught not to talk about race or money or politics or religion. Mm. Guess what? We've Everything about all those things. <laughs> <laughs> the headliners everywhere, every channel right now. Right. And so 
you know, my experience is that um, Black, Indigenous, and most, most people of color have a lot of experience talking about race. They have a lot of experience talking about both their racial identity and whiteness, and white people have very little of that experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's why affinity groups or caucusing can be helpful um, because it just creates a space where people can practice. Did you do caucusing work? At we, we did some. I don't think it was the most successful work mm -hmm. we did. I've yeah, heard a lot of mixed reviews about yeah. that. I've heard it. Uh, I've heard people who've done that. It's just become so controversial with, um, and I, I don't know, it's just fascinating to me. I happen to be both races and I can talk about white and I can talk about blacks. And so, you know, it's just interesting to me to watch people who are um, uncomfortable having a conversation about what's real uh, and what we all experience and why there's so much uh, movement to try to discredit and diminish and not hear issues that people raise in organizations. It's going to cost corporate America dearly, I believe. Uh, I think, you know, I have this book coming out and I talk about a lot of those issues in the book about like mm -hmm. their, corporate America is going to pay dearly for what it has done to particularly to black women uh, because it, they have been downright abusive. And um, you can start to see the, not start, you can see trends, you can see, uh, Kaiser Hospital just had to write a multi-million dollar check. Uh, you can see these companies that, uh, who, who else just settled another class action uh, where two black women came forward in the last week? Like it, it's happening. People are tired, they are done, and they are going to push for massive change. And so we thought it would be helpful to have uh, a comfortable, a white CEO who's comfortable talking to other white CEOs about what is necessary for change. Amen. Yeah. Work on yourself, work on your organization. And then I think the third part is contribute to a more just community. Um, before you even talk about, about profits, make the, this community, this world better. That's so awesome. Yeah. Janice Boy, yeah. this, yeah, the make it a more just world. I, I wonder how many corporate CEOs would agree to do that. Uh, without using the phrase that they have a philanthropy and they just write checks to, you know, to pretend like they're doing good, but they're actually not. And so it's a, it's a checked box. It's a checked box for a lot of companies. We've checked the box. We've hired X number of people of color. We have checked the box. And it's like, no. Do you have those folks in the C-suite? Do you have those folks at the table making the decisions? Do you go down and talk to your worker bees? Any and all of them who are doing the work, grassroots, frontline, are you talking to those folks? So, yeah. One of our listeners' comments before we close this out, afraid to be called racist for white people. I love it. White people are afraid to be called angry. Angry, oh, yeah. Angry. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Janice, Thanks, Jen. <laughs> we are at the uh, half hour here. Right. We just wanted to thank you for coming on uh, this evening and having a conversation with the community. And hopefully this will inspire some of your peers out in the broader world to do what is necessary for change. We love you and are wishing you the best at Yoga Behind Bars. Thank you thank for coming. Thank you so much. Great to talk thank to you. Both. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Set up the sacks, our favorite black businesses. Assume me, I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Assume me, I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yo. Yo, yo. I did not know Don was executive vice president, chief policy. Wash your hands, don't touch your face, wipe things down, clean up your space. When you cough and sneeze, do responsibly. If you feel 
feel your day, feel isolated at home and chill. No, you're not alone. Please pick up your phone and call 206-477-3977. King County, 206-477-3977. Public Health, 206-477-3977. King County, 206-477-3977. Public Community Radio Station, will provide you with more information. Say, Rainier Avenue Radio. Your community radio station will provide you with more information. Rainier Avenue Radio. Phil Am Radio, servicing the Filipino and Filipino Americans all over the world. Phil Am Radio, streaming live in the internet every Tuesday from 1 o'clock to 2.30 p.m. Shuttle USA Time. We are your host, Kuya Bert Kawili, Emma Heron, and Manny Panganiban. Phil Am Radio. Keen own honors and supports elders and families by offering culturally Asian and linguistically appropriate healthcare services in a healthy living community. Originally established in 1985 as the nation's first bilingual Chinese American nursing home. Keen Own now provides a full continuum of care, including wellness and education programs, home care, assisted living apartments, rehabilitative services, and long-term care. For more information, please visit keenown.org. That's K-I-N-O-N dot org. This has been a public service announcement from RainierAvenueRadio.world. Oh, yes, it's late This is Paul Pearson, host of Star Time. And when I'm not trying out new wigs and cocktail dresses, I'm listening to RainierAvenueRadio.world. Welcome back to Heartbeat Radio. I'm the host, Cindy Bright. We had a great first half of the show having uh, former CEO Janice Avery on. Isn't she just spectacular? Wouldn't it be awesome if we had more leaders like her at the helm who get this? We have an equally exciting guest for the second half uh, of our show, which is the political side of this conversation tonight. Uh, I want to welcome back in co-host Joy Stanford, and we want to welcome in Another fierce leader, uh, Senator Patty. Yes. Senator yes. Patty out of the 48th district is coming on with us this evening to update the community and talk to us about some <laughs> historic legislation that's passed. So let's welcome Senator Patty Cooterer back onto Heartbeat. Hello, Cindy. Hi, Joy. So nice Hi. to see you. How are you? This is your third or fourth time being here on Heartbeat, so we appreciate you coming back on. I love it every time. Your questions <laughs> yes. are always just, you know, so insightful. Really appreciate it. Well, we're looking forward to hearing from you, Senator Kudera. Uh, I had framed the conversation that, you know, you're from the wealthiest uh, district, the 48th district, Bellevue, Kirkland, Redmond. Um, but I know you have a broader perspective because you're involved in many more things outside of the 48th district. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you just kind of do an update with all of this legislation, this historic stuff that's passed that you want to share with the community. And then um, I've gotten some co questions that have come offline that I just encourage people to come onto the show today to ask you directly. So if they come on, you might want to hear some of our audience might be asking you some questions. So let me turn it over to you and let you talk about the things that you think is important to our community, particularly around the housing issue, the um, rent relief, the lawyers, attorney counsel, and any of the things that you want our community. All of the great stuff that happened. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a really historic session, as I'm sure you know, and we touched on a lot of areas. I mean, from um, housing to health care to police accountability to the environment uh, to gun um, legislation and tax reform. I mean, we really hit a lot of high notes, things that many of us have been working for in the trenches for a long, long time. And this was the year. Uh, and yeah, I think there are a lot of reasons for that, but I do think that the pandemic uh, really put a sense of urgency 
behind a lot of the work we were doing because so many people were hurting. And that leads me to um, the bill, Cindy, that you and I first talked about, which was um, 5160. It, it was uh, more reforms to the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, Act and added more protections uh, for renters. It was um, part of a, a three bills that we passed that really focus on uh, helping uh, low-income families and uh, indigent households and you know folks who just are are trying to maintain a roof over their heads and what 5160 did is it it extended uh, tenant protections by we're the first state in the country now to guarantee the right to an attorney in an eviction proceeding uh, for low-income families and this is really historic Interestingly, this is the first year that that protection was even introduced. That was in my bill. Um, it was the first time that, that I had introduced it. Typically, when you're introducing something like that level of protection, it takes many years to get through. But again, I think the urgency um, because of the pandemic, we were seeing, you know, between at any point in time, anywhere from 160,000 to 200,000 families who were behind in the rent. And um, it was shocking to many of us. And we knew that we could not leave those uh, families without resources to get out of this. So part of the bill is, is if they get to the point of being in an eviction proceeding, they have this guaranteed right to counsel. We know from the handful of, of cities that have uh, implemented this uh, as a right that the uh, very high percentage um, up well upwards of 50% of those tenancies will be saved. That's a really good return for the value, um, you know, for investing in the attorney for these families. But the other thing we did is we made sure that there was nearly a billion dollars in emergency rental assistance um, that is available for these families. You know, they uh, many of these folks lost their jobs due to the pandemic, due to um, the shutdown, and you know, through no fault of their own, uh, and um, and businesses couldn't keep them on because they were forced to be closed, and uh, and so we really felt it was incumbent upon the state and the federal government to come together and to uh, create these resources and an access program for these resources for these to help these families. And so that's what we did. Um, and we also created through another bill, this is one of the three I was talking about, um, we created a permanent funding source for emergency rental assistance. So we know that, um, you know, that this is an urgent situation right now, but we know it's not the last time we're gonna be in this situation. So we decided we need to, to have a funding mechanism that would go forward into the future to help people. Uh, and we are just really thrilled that we got that bill over the finish line. Uh, and there was a lot of opposition to both of those bills, but uh, we were able to do that. The last bill that we did in housing that I'm really thrilled about was uh, Representative Nicole Macri's bill uh, to, to create a just cause standard. You know, Washington had a 20 day no cause eviction provision in the Landlord Tenant Act, and uh, her bill replaces that and provides a list of, of causes that if a landlord has one of those that they're, that they're able to evict a tenant for that reason. This is for reasons other than a criminal activity, for example, or um, d damage to the property. Um, this has to do with if you're a good tenant and all of a sudden you get that 20 day no cause notice and you don't know why, um, that's gone now. Now, now the landlord has to give you a reason. So I'm very proud of the work that we've done in housing. Uh, this last year. I know there's more work to do, uh, but this was a very excellent step forward. So, so you know, let me ask sorry, you this Cindy. one. Sorry, I, I want to get a clarification on uh, a couple things because the questions that have come at me offline, um, when you talk about uh, the rental assistance program, so the, I don't remember the number you said about how many people um, need help, but the June 30th is the moratorium ends. And so I don't know if there have been any predictions or forecasting about potential um, people losing their homes at that time and what that will do for uh, either a potential bankruptcies or whatever that's going to create for people personally and for our economy. Um, but is that rental assistance program enough that people can get funding to make up for what they have not been able to pay? Or how, how does that work exactly? 
Well, uh, all excellent questions. So what, what um, the, the program, there's, there's two programs. There's the state program and the federal program. They have similar requirements, but the, they're not exactly the same. Uh, but essentially what it is is that um, a, a qualifying tenant, so someone who is um, uh, you know, behind in rent and they were behind in rent through the COVID period, they can apply uh, to obtain either state funds or federal funds or a combination of those. And, um, and then the landlord um, would pro agree to take 80% of what's owed and the other 20% would be waived. That's the current program that is administered through the Department of Commerce. And that there has been no shortage of landlords willing to waive that 20%. Uh, and, um, and the program has been uh, in place since last year, part of it, uh, but this is additional funding that we got that we need to, you know, to, to we figure it's gonna take a couple of years to really work through all of this. We also know, you're right about June 30th, been in in conversations with the governor's office they're very well aware that you know the resources that for example the right to counsel is not going to be stood up and ready to go on july 1st it, it physically can't be because our budget doesn't release the funds to to actually start um the legal representation program until july 1st so we're in discussions with the governor's office as to what that looks like what what does the next um, proclamation from the governor look like to give us that runway that we need in order to establish these resources that we know folks need um, in order to maintain their tenancies? So we are we I fully expect the governor is is he has been working with us. I fully expect um, he, he will continue to work with us to make sure that this is successful. You know, um, this program, this is important. Um, especially for the families who find themselves behind in rent, but it's also really, really critical for society, for us as a community to make sure that this program is successful. And as much as we can keep people out of the court process, we built in a mandatory mediation step along the way, which will slow the process down um, and create opportunities for the landlord and the tenant to resolve the, the outstanding rent. And we believe that, that that process will give us some of that time that we need. And then working with the governor's office, we'll be up and ready to go by uh, the fall and the end of the year is what the plan is. Nice. Why, two questions, more questions, Joy. I know you might want to have a question or two here around just these things. Are no, really let's get the fun. listeners' questions <laughs> in. Yeah, let's um, get those is, in. Is what you were describing with uh, Governor Inslee, um, implied in that is that there is a potential possibility of rent moratorium being extended beyond june 30th is that a possibility well i think all things are with with the governor at this point i mean you know um the way that the bill ended up getting passed the house put in an amendment that lifted the moratorium on june 30th that's when the proclamation was set to end anyway and the wording of that amendment was specific to just that proclamation. It doesn't foreclose uh, the governor's ability to have another moratorium should the public health conditions warrant that. And let's be honest, I mean, you know, we need to have a higher vaccination rate uh, in our state. Uh, we are seeing variants in our state. We're not out of this yet. And we do need to, to work together um, uh, as a, a community, as a state, to get out of this, but we have to understand that this is going to take some time. And the public health emergency, we're still in it. And, um, you know, and, and as far as I can see, um, the governor is listening very closely to health, public health officials, which I think is the smart thing to do. Um, that's, I think we need to listen to, to the people who understand this the best. Uh, and to make informed decisions that way. So that's how we're planning to handle this. But the goal here is to, is really to create um, opportunities along the way for landlords and tenants to resolve the outstanding rent. We've asked a lot of our landlords. I mean, I think that that's just, we need to be honest and upfront about that. Um, they were asked to go without uh, payment during this time period, which is why I was so insistent that we have this permanent funding source going forward 
That way, when someone is in need, that they have an unexpected medical bill or a car repair bill, or they lose their job and they have a temporary setback, we have these emergency um, uh, funds available because we know that it's far cheaper to help someone in the short term and help them stay housed than it is for them to fall into uh, a cycle of homelessness. And it's, it's, it's far cheaper for us as a, as a society, but, but we, you know, that family avoids the devastation of, of losing their home. And I think that that's really what's paramount. One of my Cindy Bright type of questions um, is around, um, I'm trying to think of a, a way to say it. Um, why did we create programs like this as opposed to putting the onus on either the banks to just re relief the owners? Uh, yes. why, why can't we just, for, just forgive the renters? Why do we put so many processes in place that create even more burden on people to try to keep moving forward? as opposed to just cleaning up the back end and letting the banks, look, these banks have money, they were bailed out and um, given all of their money to get back on their feet. Why can't they, what was the discussion or why did we decide to not put the onus on them to deal with it and, and free up because it's going, and free up people to be able to move forward with their lives and not have to deal with bureaucracy and courts and lawyers and all that sort of stuff. What's the thinking behind that? Well, you know, the federal mortgage forbearance program only applied to the home you were living in, right? Your residence. So what we found is that we had um, landlords who owned, um, you know, one or, you know, um, several uh, single family homes that they were renting out that they still had mortgages on that they were not, that they didn't qualify for the mortgage forbearance program because they weren't living in those homes. So we did pass um, protection at the state level for them and opened up a program for them. Um, so we are working on that, but you're right. I mean, you know, um, uh, we, we passed um, the TARP funds in lightning with lightning speed back in 2009. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, remember, it was the banks that administered the PPP program, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, they and they took a cut. They took a cut from that. Now, you would think that the banks of, of any industry would stop and say, you know, we know what it feels like to be in Having having to be bailed out, we know what that feels like. We know what it feels like to to um, be on the brink of disaster and then to get that help. And we're this is our community service. We're going to do this gratis because of of how we were treated. But they didn't, you know. And so another piece that I worked on, and I've talked to you about this before, um, is the creation of a public bank. Mm -hmm. And if we had had that. It got, you know, it almost got to the House floor for a vote this year, got out of the Senate. Um, but if we had had that in place when this happened, the public bank could have been the one administering the PPP and done it without taking a cut. Then every single cent would have gone to help, you know, those homeowners who, ha who were in that situation and, and business owners, small business owners in particular. And the other thing that we heard is that the banks were picking and choosing their friends, you know, the customers they liked better over others. And, you know, we just shouldn't be in that kind of situation at all. I know a lot of small businesses that suffered this time. And um, and we just have to, yes. And, um, and, you know, we have to do better when it comes to being able to be more nimble. Uh, but as you know, I mean, <laughs> We have to we have to release the funds on our budget timeline, which we are you know we don't release them until July first of of the biennium, and that's the way it works. And you know we did an emergency release of funds earlier in the session, but in order to have a fully funded budget, and we are the only state in the country that's obligated to balance our budget for four years out rather than two years, that takes a lot of extra work. Mm. Yeah. And, and it I, does. I wanted to know if you were aware of how many people logged on and supported your bills because I was one. <laughs> um, but the housing equity folks in Seattle, you know, um, 
there was the wall and and um, all those folks from that that nonprofit. They were rallying folks and emails and and so I was told that hundreds of people were signing into these housing bills and signing in pro and signing up to speak. And I just wanted to know, as someone who was in it at the moment, um, were you made aware of how many people were just backing you and backing these bills? I mean, and little people, this is just everyday people that were coming on and doing that. I didn't know if you knew that. So, Yes, we actually have a record of the number of people that sign in to support the bills. <laughs> this one had a record number and you know this is one of the benefits of, of a remote session is that we were able to allow more people yes because they didn't have to travel to olympia to do it and they didn't have to go to olympia to sign in they could do it online and so we, we really saw an increase in participation which was awesome and i think what you're going to see next year is a hybrid version of that um, as we get back to in-person uh, committee meetings, but I think we're—I think that's here to stay. The remote testimony. What's right. the first thing you did after session? I'm sorry, I have to ask that <laughs> for fun. What was the first thing you did for fun? For fun? Oh, because gosh. it was such a—it just seemed like it was such an emotional session, and it was—it was there was you guys did a lot of work, and so I'm like, what'd you do? Like. What's it's the first thing it was, Joy. It was, I described it as uh, arduous. It was. I wish I was there with you, but no such luck. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can tell you that for fun, um, honestly, I went for the longest walk because oh, you're cooped no. up in your place and you're in front of the Zoom, you know, camera all day long. And, um, and it just felt good to get outside and smell some fresh air quite honestly and i went for a really long walk but that Good. that that was fun yeah Good. senator cooter i'm sorry i'm gonna bring you back to business <laughs> sorry joy <laughs> um, i i just wanted to um ask like because the 48th is where a lot of the wealth and there was a capital gains uh tax passed uh, can you talk a little bit uh, to the community about uh the implications of that capital gains and any other progress on your district uh, stepping up and helping pay more equitable uh, pieces of taxes here in the state of Washington. Good, good. Yeah, that was uh, historic that we got that passed. And I've been a big proponent of the capital gains tax um, because we have a broken tax structure in Washington state. I don't know anybody that likes our tax structure. Um, and, uh, and so what it means is that with all the sideboards on that on that law, that about 8,000 taxpayers out of, uh, I think it's 3.2 million in the state, uh, will pay a capital gains tax. And I can tell you, Cindy, when I was knocking on doors a couple of years ago, I guess it would be three years ago now, mm -hmm. um, uh, I ran across an individual who, you know, beautiful home uh, on Lake Washington, a uh, very nice dog house too, by the way. Um, and uh, and I was talking to him about the capital gains tax and he was very quiet. And then he said, you go for that, Patty. He said, it won't make a dent in my lifestyle. And I thought, you know what? He's being honest. It won't. It won't make a dent in his lifestyle. And the people that I heard from uh, who will pay that tax from my district, they asked me to support it. So they understand that um, that it's okay for them to pay more. In fact, it's it's the right thing to do for them to pay more, and they're totally fine with it. In my district, in the 48th, there'll be about 745 people who will pay that tax. So, and I have my district is about 156,000 people. So we're talking, you know, less than 1% of the population, it's like 0.021% will pay this tax. It's really a small number, uh, comparatively speaking, but what it raises and more importantly, what that money goes to fund is what's critical here. It will fund the working families tax credit, which is a re refund for working families. Um, to help them with, you know, for example, the sales tax that we all have to pay that's very regressive and hits them the hardest. Um, and we'll also go to help them uh, with um, increase in, in the gas tax, things like that 
that will go and, and, and help them. So it'll go to fund the Working Families um, Tax Credit and the Eg uh, Education Legacy Fund, which um, goes to help our schools. And I think we all know how important our schools are. So it's really important that we start, you know, we talk a lot about uh, having uh, programs that really are, um, uh, you know, the best in the nation and give opportunity for all, et cetera. But we don't put our money where our mouth is. Um, and we still have work to do on our tax structure. And there's ongoing work uh, happening right now uh, to continue with changing our tax structure. But you probably saw that that, uh, the, the capital gains tax has been challenged in the courts. So, yes. but the same argument that was uh, made against the real estate excise tax is being made um, to to support the claim that the capital gains tax is unconstitutional. And all I can say is uh, the court did not agree that the real estate excise tax was unconstitutional, and I don't see that this one is either. How can we guarantee our constituents, and I say constituents, so people in our communities, that that money for that capital gains will go towards that those programs? Because that was one thing as a candidate that people kept pounding at us is, what is that money going for? And how can we be sure it's not dropping into the general fund and you guys are just going to use that any which way you want? And uh, it's like, yeah, if well, it's deemed law. for this, how do you make that so? Well, the law, the law connected it to those funding th mechanisms. So it said, you know, the money that's raised from this will go to the Working Families Tax Credit and will go to the uh, Education Legacy Fund. So that's how I know it's going there. Awesome. Um, yeah. And we've made a commitment. And, you know, we're not in the habit of passing taxes just to pass taxes. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? Uh, we do need to fund uh, certain programs that make a difference in people's lives. And quite frankly, it turns out that when you invest in people, everybody benefits from that. Amen. Amen. Cindy, you had another question? Yeah, Senator Kuder, I know we've just got about another minute. Um, I wanted to just uh, touch on um, restaurant recovery and the small business recovery. Uh, the notion that people believe that the extended unemployment uh, has made folks lazy and not want to get back to work. Um, I um, Can you just speak to quickly what the recovery is looking like for the state of Washington with our uh, service industry, food industry, where a lot of our jobs are. Yeah, and that industry has been hit the hardest. This was not uh, a recession that affected all businesses equally, as we know. Uh, and, uh, and some made billions extra uh, while others suffered terribly. And, um, you know, we unfortunately, we are going to lose some small businesses in the state. And uh, I think the last estimate I saw was about 30 percent. It's heartbreaking that that we didn't have programs in place, um, you know, to to be prepared for something like this. Um, my hope is that given the lessons learned, the very painful lessons that we've learned, that we are going to make even more steps next session to shore up our fiscal foundation so that we are better prepared next time. Um, but I do know that a lot of small businesses were able to access PPP funds. Um, I talked to one small business owner today who told me that they did get um, some funding that really has made a tremendous difference in, in their little shop. And I'm really happy about that. Awesome. Senator Cooter, we are at the hour and we had you some believe more it. We'll just have to have you back again. <laughs> it always goes by so quick. Um, yes. thank you for coming on and talking with people are so interested to hear, you know, most people don't sign on to legislative sessions and don't know what the what some of these programs mean. They we just read them in the headlines and then people are trying to figure out what that means. So we thoroughly uh, I love you personally, you know that. Appreciate you. Uh, just love having yeah. you come on and talk with us. I uh, so much appreciate that. And we will have you back here soon. So um, to our listeners who joined us today, thank you for tuning in and asking questions and making comments. I saw the comment feed was blowing up. I uh, appreciate that. And everyone have a good evening and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. You uh-huh, yeah. Assuming I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yo, yo, yo.